if we just took a population of yeah. middle-aged, yeah. healthy individuals, yeah. Yeah. and we des- we could design an experiment where yeah. you had the placebo arm, yeah. the metformin arm, the rapamycin arm, the yeah. SGLT2 inhibitor arm, and the GLP-1 agonist arm, what is your prediction in length of life or additional years of life given in that uh, six arm study or whatever it is? I, I think the, the, the last three would be comparable metformin I'm skeptical of. So RAPA, SGLT2, yeah. GLP1. Yeah, I, I just, I don't, we don't have data in healthy people that much with SGLT2 and, and GLP1. I mean- So mechanism of action is what? If, these, if, the, if the GLP1 group and the SGLT2 group are metabolically healthy, they don't have glucose excursions that are high, they're, you know, they're Completely yeah. insulin sensitive. What, is, what do you believe is the mechanism of action? I, I guess you know if it. I, th- I I guess I'm going by a different statement, which is most people we're calling healthy are not totally metabolically healthy. Fair. Uh, and so in those cases, I think there would be a benefit. But then I guess now, the I don't question... know in the perfectly optimized person whether there'd be a benefit. And I I every time I talk to a doctor, I ask them, Are you losing more lean muscle mass with these drugs than you are just by fasting or or, or lifestyle? And I get. If I ask ten doctors, I get ten answers. So I don't know what the I don't know what the answer to that question is. So. But I think the reason that, at least as a thought experiment, it's an interesting question is because if the GLP one agonists and SGLT two inhibitors only work if you have some degree yeah. of um, glucose yeah. irregularity, yeah, then it begs the question. Well, it says. Look, glucose homeostasis is one of the most important features yeah. of living. Great. Yeah. Um, but if you could correct that with diet, sleep, and exercise, which you can. Yeah, I agree. You can. Um, it's hard, but yeah. if you, it could be done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then those things aren't going after fundamental pillars of aging because people who eat well, who exercise well, and sleep well still age. Yeah, it's it's going. It's answering. You know, Matt and I debate this all the time about. You know, and we did it. We published a study in mice recently where we analyzed all the data that's out there in mice, and um, and we tried to determine, you know, how, wh- where's reality on interventions that extend lifespan in mice? Because if the short lived, if the control mice are really short lived, which happens a lot, a lot. Why is that? It's just really hard to control. I mean, if you look at the ITP data, the control mice are all over the board and they're very well controlled, yep. the best scientists doing the experiment. We see a lot of variation too. I, I just think it's, there are some cases they're bad vivariums and that make, causes a problem. But even in good vivariums, I don't know. It's true in every organism, in yeast and worms. One cohort of worms will all live a little bit shorter. One cohort of worms will live a little bit longer. It's cohort dependent, but I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, if the if the mice are short lived, if your extension is there, all you can say is it's longevity normalizing. Uh, you don't know that it's slowing aging. It's only when the controls are really long lived and you're getting extension that you can really make the argument it's longevity extending. And so that gets to your question. The real answer, though, is dependent on how many people you believe that are optimized right now, because it's yeah, impossible it's very to few. do the study. Yeah, right? no, no, of course. It, 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 it is few. normalizing works in this population, yeah. trust me, at least for health, for, for keeping people healthy. But whether it's really slowing aging is an is a open question, I think. I think the best case would be rapamycin there. Yeah. And, and then, of course, it begs the question, which is, could these effects be additive? Right. Yeah. So, so would there be a benefit to a person who is on balance quite healthy, but yeah. let's say their average, glu- let's say their hemoglobin A1C, if it is indeed an accurate representation of their average glucose is 5.4%. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what that translates to. It probably translates to an average blood glucose of 110 or so milligrams per deciliter. Yeah. But the data there, there are data that show, based on hemoglobin A1C, that lower is always better. Yep. So 5.0 is better than 5.4, yep. even though 5.4 yep. is deemed completely healthy. Yep. And that's a, that's all-cause mortality data. So um, we're saying we take a person who's at 5.4. They're not even pre-diabetic. They can't even. They can barely see where pre-diabetic yeah. starts, um, let alone diabetic. 
But we give them an SGLT2 inhibitor. They come I, I'm from, at 5.4. Can I, I can volunteer for this. There stuff. you go. So you go from 5.4 <laughs> yeah. down to 5.1 yeah. just on the basis of that drug. Yeah. We throw a GLP-1 agonist on top of that. Yeah. Now you're at 4.9. Yeah. Um, then we give you rapamycin, which really doesn't impact your glucose, but we think it's going to yeah. do something a little bit different. Um, you would say in that situation, you might believe that there's some actual uh, I think it's protection, feasible. but not I, adding metformin. At I that don't want point. to lose muscle mass, though. <laughs> and which of those drugs would you be most afraid of? The GLP-1 agonist or RAPA? GLP-1 agonist. Okay. I, I think lean muscle mass is like super important. <laughs> yeah, it's probably better to have high lean muscle mass and be a little bit more fat than it is to be low on both is my best guess. Combining interventions, <laughs> you know, first of all, I will say two things before I say what I'm going to say. One is that I believe we need to empower people to make decisions on their own health. And so I support hackers. If they want to you know, educate themselves and try different things and they know what the benefits and risks might be and what we know and we don't know, more power to them. I feel like part of the reasons we get such low compliance in medications is that we don't empower people. We don't give them choices. They don't know why they're doing things. We just tell them what to do and people don't respond well to that. So having said that, I can't pick three interventions that work well together <laughs> and, and a mouse, you know, and we do these studies all the time. The thing, they're more likely to cancel each other out than to have additive effects. And so if you're mixing 20 colors of or taking 20 pills, it's like mixing 20 colors of paint together. You're going to get some ugly gray outcome. Or at best, you're going to get an unknown outcome that we can't predict. So mm. I'm, I'm really cautious and want to tell people that, you know, there are a lot of people out there promoting doing a million different things at the same time. I try one or two things at the same time. <laughs> and I, I try to see how my body responds. I measure things, measure even simple measures are useful. Uh, and I think that... Um, if you're doing 10 things, you're, you don't have any idea what's working and what's not working and whether things might be impairing each other. And I really think that's a scary path to go down. Now, what do you make of the data that I talk about all the time, which look at the hazard ratios for mortality based on high VO2 max and high muscle mass and high strength and how those three things stand out so far above anything else? Uh, meaning, like when you look at hazard ratios associated yeah. with smoking, yeah. type 2 diabetes, yeah. even cancer, yeah. um, they are not as lethal as being incredibly weak, incredibly low in muscle mass, and incredibly low in fitness. Yeah. And do you, how much causality do you think is there versus how much of that is just, those are just such good markers of health? I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.